this is going to go well. Yeah. Okay, so, hi, welcome. Um, a lot more people than I originally thought. Uh, that's fun. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this talk is called Defender Economics. Uh, uh, it's not actually about money, but yeah. I, <laughs> anyway, so I'm not going to give away money or anything like that. That's too bad. But someone actually pointed out to me when I did this was that, well, this is kind of suitable because it's just one dollar bills, <laughs> and that is exactly what defense typically has. No. It isn't. Defense has a lot of money, and they still have no budget at all, which is kind of weird. OK, so who am I? Uh, I am from Gothenburg, Sweden. I work as a security analyst for a company called iSecure Sweden. Uh, security analyst can mean anything. Uh, I do security analyst analysis on the defensive side, so I, I do Log analysis, uh, intrusion analysis, malware analysis, threat and vulnerability analysis, you name it. Uh, before I joined uh, iSecure, uh, I used to work for a really big automotive company. So if you Google automotive and Gothenburg, <laughs> you'll find out pretty <laughs> quickly. Uh, the point of this is that I know what it's like to work at a really, really, really big company. I know it's not easy. Uh, on, I'm Adelind on Twitter. I philosophize, if that's a word, a lot, which basically means that I have very, very, very strong opinions about stuff. So if you want to argue, that's good. Uh, I consider myself a security Swiss army knife. That does not mean that I'm sharp. just means that I'm versatile. Uh, okay, so what is this talk about? Well, it's mainly about attackers, because I think that we in the security industry in many ways think about attackers uh, in the wrong way. We don't really understand the r reality that an attacker lives in. Uh, and it's about understanding them, their capabilities, and more importantly, their constraints. Strengths, so both what they can do and both what they can't do for various reasons. Uh, and ultimately, how this information can be used to get better at defense. Uh, and as a bonus, if you're doing offensive security, uh, this will provide some input on how to you know, try to scope, like when you, if you're doing pen tests and Things like that. Uh, and there's a lot of you know, really smart people who have you know, done work or expressed opinions in this area before. So you should really you know, uh, look up the previous work of uh, Dan Guido, Dino Daisovi, and Jarno Niemele, who I will be referencing. Uh, there will be links to everything in, uh, in, in the talk, and I will put it online so you don't have to take pictures of it if you don't want to. And since this is a talk about security, this is not a talk about fixing anything, because that's not really doable in security, I think. I mean, s small things can probably be fixed, but uh, it's basically more about raising the bar for attackers than actually fixing things. Okay, so let's get to it then. Okay, so we all know that security in general is hard. And defense in particular is very, very hard, right? So, I mean, us in defense, we very often feel like this guy. Uh, and there's a lot of sayings in security about this. So, for example, the defender's dilemma in where it said that, so 
The attacker needs to find one way in, the defender needs to defend everything, right? Technically, it's really hard to argue against that, right? And another saying that has actually come up a couple of times during the day is that, so when I talk to people, like especially people in the, on the offensive side, uh, and I say that, well, you could do this, and they say, well, I mean, I could find my way around that. And yeah, I mean, there are no defenses that are perfect. I mean, there are defenses that are close to perfect, but you can't really use them because that disables a lot of other things, like never connecting your computer to a network. OK, so that computer is pretty useless then, right? Uh, and of course, we've got the media. So this is kind of a reference to the uh, talk that was in here earlier about FireEye, for example. So both vendors and media are really good at telling us how awesome attackers are, right? And you know how targeted attacks is the new normal, and attackers are laughing at, at, at our defenses, and everybody's compromised anyway. And this is also, you know, kind of true. But when we talk about it, attackers in this way, it kind of, you know, creates an attacker mythology. So for those of you who don't know, this is Abath. He's the lead singer of a Norwegian black metal band. There are a lot of really funny memes on him because he looks funny. <laughs> So I'm using him. <laughs> but the thing about when you talk about attackers in a way, in this way, it's kind of hard to come up with ways to do defense. Because if we're constantly told that attackers are so awesome, they're laughing at you, they're in your network now, and they're, they're like, I mean, and that creates a situation like this. And this is when bad defensive decisions gets made. So this is when you're like, oh my god, attackers are so advanced. I'm going to spend a million dollars on appliances that I don't really know what they do. Uh, which is not good for anyone except for the people selling those appliances. Okay, so here's the thing, and this is purely coincidental that this, that this slide is called the thing about the thing after Haroon's keynote, which was great, I thought. So on the one hand, yeah, attackers are getting better all the time because that's what they do. I mean, that's their job. But, and... No, it's not possible to protect against everything. You can't do that. So, I mean, last year, there was, I don't think it was 10,000 vulnerabilities that were assigned CVs, but it was pretty close, right? Yeah. And, I mean, you can't really keep up with that. It's not possible. But... On the other hand, no attacker really has infinite resources. So the assumption in like sayings like the defender's dilemma and you know the skilled and motivated attacker is that the attacker has the time and skills and budget to like go on and attack until he gets in. That's kind of an unrealistic assumption, right? I mean, that's really, that's not really, you know, how it works. And do you really need to protect against everything? Because I'm pretty sure that a, the vast majority of the vulnerabilities that were assigned CVs last year, the 9,000 something vulnerabilities, has never been exploited in the wild. 
And this pretty much comes from, because when we talk about attackers, we tend to think hackers. So a hacker is a, like, in, so in my mind, a hacker, I consider myself something of a hacker, but in my mind, a hacker is someone who is really good at solving problems and who is very innovative and will come up with like new ways to solve problems. But an attacker today in 2015 typically isn't really a hacker. I mean, there are sim sim similarities and there are hackers involved, but an attacker today is more of an organization than like a person, right? And that means that hackers and attackers have you know, pretty different considerations. So where a hacker could just think that, okay, I can think of 100 ways into this network. An attacker needs to think about different things. Like, for example, I, I think this is a great tweet. So as soon as you have an organization, you have other things to think about. You have to keep your boss happy. You have to keep your budget. You might have to keep or follow you know, designated workflows. You might have to use certain tools. You might have to do a lot of things that you, know, you and I do in our jobs, but you know, in a different context. Uh, and Dino Daisovi said in a speech or a presentation called Attacker Math in 2011 that if the cost of attack is less than the value of your information to the attacker, you will be attacked. And this is kind of a, he's basically in a really fancy way saying that what you do has to have a positive ROI, which is I mean, it doesn't you know, necessarily uh, have to do with money, but the cost of the attack has to be less than what the return is. Otherwise, it's not going to be worth it. I'm sure there are you know, uh, cases where this is not really valid, but in most cases, it holds up. So, the attacker economics in this is that for an attack to take place, it has to be economically motivated. And I say economically because it doesn't necessarily have to be about money. And when it's motivated, the attack has to be executed with the resources available to the attacker at that time. So, and the bottom line to this is that the attacker has to keep it within his budget. And that budget will, of course, vary for different reasons. And we're coming to that. So if we flip that coin, we can kind of say that the defender economics is that if the defender can figure out what the limitations, what the weak spots in a certain attacker is, he can make those areas more expensive for, for the attacker. And by doing that, he can break the attacker's budget. So it's no longer worth it to attack that particular target for that particular attacker. And I can see a lot of you are going like, hmm, I wonder what this, what, 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 where is going with this? Uh, and that's okay. So how do you actually do that? Okay, so the first thing you need to do is actually know your enemy. And this is kind of something that vendors say. So I've read a lot of blog posts where vendors are saying like, know thy adversary. And then they say nothing about the adversary except that they're really advanced. Uh, and that doesn't really help, right? <laughs> so we, we need to actually do research on attackers to be able to find this out. 
And the way we do this is by attacker profiling. This is not you know, a really serious, really you know, low-level uh, profiling. And I'm only going to use three areas uh, to be able to provide some examples. You can basically use which areas you want. They will probably vary uh, depending on the attacker. But these areas are motivation, resources, and procedures. This is not threat modeling. Uh, this is this touches base on threat modeling, but it's not. I'm I can't really do threat modeling. I haven't read that threat modeling book by Adam something. Um, so what we need to know is what's the motivation of the attacker? What's the motivation behind the attack? And more importantly, what's the level of motivation per target? So if you look at my motivation meter here. You can see that the NSA, when the NSA is eavesdropping, they are really motivated when it comes to eavesdropping on Edward Snowden. So they will spend a lot in, in achieving that. So that's because their motivation per target is really high. But when it comes to this old lady who I found online and have no idea who it is. I hope it's no one's grandmother or something. Uh, is that guy in here? No? Good. So they're, they're probably not very motivated uh, when it comes to spying on her. So if she drops off their radar because they, s they spy on everyone, they will just like assume that, OK, so her computer broke or she died. Uh, so they won't really, you know, assign someone into, you know, finding out why because they don't care about her. And then we get the resources. And this could be, you know, pretty much anything you know about the resources of the attacker. But typically, like, people, skills, tools, infrastructure, supply chain, etc. And the willingness to actually spend these resources depends on motivation. So no motivation, no spent resources. Uh, and then we get the, the procedures, which is basically, so how does this attacker actually do attack? And this could be like preferred attack vectors, typical post-exploitation activities. Is this attacker actually willing to change the way he does attack? So does he have several preferred attack vectors and so on? And procedures for an attacker who is organized can't be like do it a different way for every attack because that's really uneconomical and that makes it that makes every attack more expensive than it has to be. So the more efficiency and reusability and scalability that can be built into these procedures, the better for the attacker because it means that it's going to be less expensive, which basically means higher budget. Okay, so to apply this reasoning to some examples, I have two very different examples. Uh, this is to show that the reasoning works, or I think it works. I'm open for criticism, of course. But the examples we're going to take a look at is Google Chrome versus Malware. So this is non-targeted malware, like run-of-the-mill, high-volume malware. And big company X versus APT groups. Uh, and the company on the picture has nothing to do with the actual company, which, because this is a, a, uh, a made-up scenario. Okay, but starting with Google Chrome versus malware. So, uh, most of you probably know that Google Chrome is the world's most popular web, web browser. So in um, December 2014, Google, Google Chrome had a market share of over 60% for web browsers. Uh, the source of this is a website called W3Schools, which is like a website for aspiring web developers. And so maybe 
an aspiring web developer is more prone to use Google Chrome than Internet Explorer. So maybe these numbers are a bit skewed, but let's say 55 or 50 then. So Google Chrome has had 220 remote code execution vulnerabilities reported uh, between 2012 and 2014, according to the open source vulnerability database, who is usually a, a pretty reliable s source. So with this information, doesn't Google Chrome sound like a pretty good infection vector for malware, right? Okay, so if you look at like a really, really high level attacker profile for malware, we can see that malware is volume driven. Malware doesn't really care who it infects, it cares that it infects uh, enough targets. But it, it isn't really going to notice if a particular target isn't infected. Uh, and malware prefers derived by downloads for the same reason it being volume driven. Uh, that's easy to scale. Uh, and malware requires file system access. So like a universal cross-site scripting bug isn't really going to help malware. To be able to infect someone, you actually need file system access to their machine. And if you look at these three, you can see that what I said earlier about Google Chrome having a huge market share, Google Chrome having a lot of vulnerabilities, it, it kind of matches those, right? So volume driven, uh, Google, there's a lot of people using Google Chrome, derived by downloads, Google Chrome is a browser, uh, and it requires fast system access, lots of remote code execution <coughs> vulnerabilities. Okay, good. There's something really interesting here, and that's, uh, so malware has a really you know, interesting supply chain dependency, which is exploit kits. So malware typically gets its exploits from exploit kits. And if you haven't looked at Dan Guido's exploit intelligent project work, you, sh you really should. It's a couple of years old, but not much have changed. Uh, and in that, he found out that, that pretty much no exploits in exploit kits are developed by exploit kit authors. So it's generally repurposed exploits from other sources. So like from Metasploit or security researcher blogs or you know, that kind of thing. So it's basically repurposed. They replace the shell code, do some modifications, and that's about it. Uh, and exploits like that are typically developed for a default installation of the target software. So if you just want to do a proof of concept, you're not going to do, and then I'm going to do this bypass and this bypass and this bypass. You're just going to pop calc XE and everyone will upload. Uh, exploit kits actually have very few zero days. I know that there's been three flash zero days in exploit kits this year. I don't really think that's a trend. And before that, the latest zero day in an exploit kit, uh, as far as I know, was in 2013. So not very many, at least. And the targets, the target software in exploit kits are pretty limited, too, because they can't really choose what they, uh, what they integrate. They have to make do with what's available, and also you they will probably go for the thing that you know gives them file system access in the easiest way. So if we if we look at exploit kit activity in 2014, uh, and this is from the Contagio um, exploit kit table, uh, we can see that for 21 of the biggest exploit kits, only 10 new exploits were added in. <laughs> 2014, and that was seven flash and th and three IE, so no Google Chrome. And if you look at how long it took for those exploits to get integrated in exploit kits, we can see that for flash it took a minimum of seven days and a maximum of 88 days. 
And for IE, it took a minimum of eight days and a maximum of 179. So for the sake of the example, we're going to give exploit kits a, b a break and say that exploit kits can integrate any exploit seven days after patch, right, to be really nice. That's not true, but let's say that. So if we look at the Chrome security model, we can see that it has a really strong foundation. It's actually made for, with, with security in mind. Uh, and it has a really robust sandbox, really, really good sandbox. Uh, and all the tabs and all the plugins run as unprivileged processes in this sandbox. So if you exploit something in a tab, like the HTML uh, parser, you still have to break out of the sandbox to achieve file s s system access. This is not uncommon in like modern s s software, but still. Uh, Google Chrome produces patches really fast when they have to. So they have the capability to actually produce and deploy a patch in 24 hours. They've done this a couple of times. This is something that they say, we will do this if we see like a zero day in the wild or if someone drops a zero day uh, or something like that. And they're also able to actually deliver the patches to users really fast. So uh, Google Chrome has silent security updates uh, which, you know, no one knows how to turn that off. It's possible, but very few do, which is good. So all in all, this means that when Google Chrome <coughs> releases a patch, like 90% of the entire Google Chrome user base is patched within a week. And this is like unofficial numbers, which I have checked with unofficial, official, unofficial sources. So it's not taken out of thin air. And the rest of the 10% are like people who restart their browser uh, seldom, or organizations who have chosen to uh, not do uh, like that kind of patching, to do centrally managed patching, which in this case I think is a pretty bad idea actually. But so if we, if we look at the fight of Chrome versus malware, we can see that, first of all, it's really hard to write a working exploit for Chrome. You have to chain several vulnerabilities together, and this takes a lot of time, which means that if you do that, you're probably not going to just drop security. You're probably going to like uh, hand it over to the Google bug bounty or sell it to CDI or something like that. And this means that there's not very many publicly available Chrome exploits out there, which means that exploit kits can't get them. And even if they could, and they could integrate that vulnerability in seven, or that exploit in seven days, uh, remember what I said about patching? So by the time an exploit is integrated in an ex exploit kit, pretty much everyone who uses Chrome will be patched anyway, which means that there's really no market for exploit kits. There's no, uh, it's not feasible for exploit kits to actually use Chrome exploits, which is why you know, malware isn't targeting Chrome. Okay, so so moving on to the next uh, the next example. So big company X. Big company X is a really big company. They have 50,000 employees. Uh, they have a centrally managed IT, which is not uncommon among, I mean, medium to large companies. Uh, they don't do rapid patching, which is also very common for, you know, medium to large companies or companies in general. Uh, and this is because they have a lot of, you know, internal dependencies, everything breaks if you go over like IE9 or something like that. 
they have a really low security awareness uh, um, among their em employees. These people will click anything, <coughs> preferably twice. <laughs> and this is also not uncommon when it comes to this kind of company. Security awareness is something you should take seriously. It's not something you should rely on. And big company X, of course, has an APT problem. Oh my god, cyber. Uh, okay, so if we look at uh, a high level attacker profile when it comes to APT groups, and uh, this is kind of, you know, this is not an exercise in how to protect against APT. This, this data will be, you know, not conclusive as everything else, but it's for the example. So we know that APT groups are target driven. They know who they are, they are attacking, right? So they're going to notice if their attack fails. Uh, they typically use phishing. Phishing is a really you know, effective way to get to what you want. It's basically the closest route to the information you're after because you typically can figure out who has access to the information you're after. Uh, they've been known to use both patched vulner vulnerabilities, so old days and zero days. Uh, they use both off-the-shelf and custom tools and malware. Uh, they're really, really good at the post-intrusion phase, so when they're already in. They're really efficient, they're really disciplined, they know exactly what they're looking for, they're really good at finding it. Uh, they're also really good at maintaining a presence, staying under the radar for a long time. And they're generally very, very professional. And this is, I mean, you can have like uh, opinions about the stealthy presence part, but they're stealthy enough. Okay, so there's been some, some previous research into APT groups and APT attacks. So, at the Virus Bulletin Conference in 2013, uh, Jarno Niemelef from F-Secure had a talk called Statistically Effective Protection Against APT Attacks. And what he did was that he took like 930 exploit samples that F-Secure had found uh, in the wild. He ran them against a number of... Um, uh, and uh, all these exploits had been attributed somehow to APT actors. And he ran them against a number of different, like, mitigation techniques. Uh, and one of them was Microsoft's free tool, EMET. And that was found to block every one of those exploits. Uh, so, th so that's good, right? So this is not conclusive, because this is a targeted attacker. A targeted attacker will notice that I mean, uh, okay, this didn't work, might come back with an EMIT bypass or might try something else, right? Uh, so if we look at APT groups that were active in 2014, and I've, okay, I've only looked at 13 groups because I only wanted a data set that was sufficient for the example. This is not, you know, uh, defending <coughs> against APTs 101. One, this is not that. So, but all of these groups are from Kaspersky's site, uh, apt.securelist.com, and they're, they're pretty well documented. But um, these groups have been active for as long as 2003. Not all of them, but some of them. 100% of them used spear phishing. Some of them used additional attack vectors too, like for example, the Dark Hotel group did like a Wi-Fi man in the middle attack. Very, very rare. I think other attack vectors have been used like three times since 2003. So not very much. About 50% of them has used zero days. But none of them has used more than two. Uh, and this is only what's documented. They could have used more but and not got, gotten caught. And only one of those exploits bypassed a non-default in 
installation. In that case, it was a hardened Windows 8.1 system. Uh, and hardened on a system level, not on like the software that was targeted level. And if we look at the software they exploded, uh, not very surprising, uh, Adobe Reader is on the top, and then Flash and Java, three each, uh, Windows, I, Microsoft Office, and WinRAR, which is kind of surprising, I guess, but whatever works. So if we take this info, and we look, okay, so what are the strengths and weaknesses of these APT actors? By the way, we should stop using the APT acronym. It's uh, already taken. Uh, but if we look at that, we can see that their strengths are what they do after they get, get in. They're really good at that. And they're really good at staying under the radar on a network for a long time. And they generally behave in a very professional, disciplined, st structured way. Uh, and if we look at what they're not so good at, it's, so they get a kind of predictable attack vector. We know, we pretty much know, I shouldn't say that we know, but we can be pretty certain that there's going to be an email. At some point, there's going to be an email with an attachment or a link. And it has also been shown that the exploits that they use are actually pretty crappy. I mean, there was a Sophos paper, which I'm not referencing in here because I've forgotten to add it. I just remembered it. That shown like the beginner mistakes in writing that exploit. And they're basically, even if the exploits are working, they, they are just barely working. So with that in mind, what would some you know, reasonable options be? And remember, we're not talking about making something 100% secure here. We're talking about raising the bar in, an, in a way that is, that is cheap for the defender but costly for the, the, the attacker. So some options for company X. So the cheapest thing that company X can do, which we've already talked about, is actually to deploy some exploit mitigation measures. So um, company X has a centrally managed IT. So they can easily deploy like configuration changes, new applications to workstations. So, they can easily deploy something like EMET over all their workstations in a couple of days. That would cost them very little, some testing and some maintenance. Uh, you can also do stuff like actually securely configure commonly targeted software and r remove some of the, the, the tax surface. So, for example, an exploit that targets the JavaScript uh, parser in Adobe Reader would be totally worthless if Adobe Reader uh, wasn't allowed to execute JavaScript, right? So that kind of thing. So, and if company X want to do something that will cost them a little bit more, but that will also be very effective, they could deploy a, a third party sandbox. Now, this could be expensive depending on, on the sandbox. But you could actually use something like sandboxy, which is not very ex expensive. And it would still add something that the attacker is not expecting. Because even if his exploit is working, it would be like code execution in another sandbox. And there's basically no way, uh, except for maybe OSINT, to know what the sandbox is. And I'm not saying that rely on obscurity, but adding an unknown layer can be very effective. And you know, then there's always you know, the very expan expensive route that you don't really know if it's going to 
the effective, and that is to buy your way out. So there was a FireEye talk in here earlier, or it was an APT protection talk, which was very interesting, that demonstrated this pretty clearly. You can buy that product, it's going to cost you a lot, and you have no idea what it does. Okay, so the conclusion for this, another Abbott picture, you see he's awesome. You should all Google Abbott. Okay, so I have a son, he's five, we watch the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles together. Master Splinter, who is their sensei, he's my idol, he's so smart. He's like, if Sun Tzu was a rat, that would be that guy. So, and he said, you do not fight the armor, you fight the man inside. This is pretty much what we need to do to get better at defense. We need to start thinking and trying to understand attackers better. Because we're focusing on, on much more shallower things. We're like, who can patch the fastest? And that's just not going to work out. So, security is hard. Attackers are not made of magic, to paraphrase Bruce Schneier. And every attacker has limitations. And if you can understand those limitations, you can actually build defenses uh, that is going to be costly for attackers to bypass, and thus raising the bar, which is you know, all we can hope for. And raising the cost of attack can be very effective, because I've only talked about prevention. And I'm not saying don't do uh, network security monitoring. I work with doing network security monitoring, so that would be a really stupid thing of me to say. But uh, we shouldn't forget that responding to fewer incidents is going to be much better for us. And as I said, this is not about being 100% secure. That doesn't exist. It's all about making it harder for attackers. We're still going to get compromised, and we're going to have to deal with that. Okay, so, and for the offensive people, and for everyone, really, we have to realize that thinking like a hacker is not the same as thinking like an attacker. There are a whole set of different considerations. And when you talk to your clients about scopes, use real attacks and, you know, base your scopes on that, because Companies get owned in the same ways all of the time, and we're not testing enough for those methods, I think. And in the eternal words of Shania Twain, so you're an attacker, that don't impress me much. Thank, whoa, ah, crap. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm expecting a lot of criticism now. That's far, so thanks. Yep. Okay. Thank, thank you. I, I agree with you most of the ways. But if you go back to the slides of the mitigations, and then you, with your experience from a, from a big company. You mean secure, that? Secure software configuration. I mean, that's where it starts, right? Um, your example with, with um, JavaScript and Adobe. And when I get back to my big other car company and find my, my travel expenses, what do I have to do? Turn on JavaScript because SAP uh, yeah. stuff doesn't work without JavaScript. Okay, I mean... For instance, um, you analyze um, content management systems and not even the vendor knows all the default passwords inside them. No, no, I mean, and that's a problem. Starts, I mean, right? sure. So That's pretty good. The cheap and effective is most often not what we think of as cheap if, if you think of it in small scale. No. And that's, that's but, where you usually get hit. Yeah, but what you should actually do, uh, or my, my suggestion for what you should actually do uh, is dig up a number of exploits from like the last two years that have been used in this kind of attack, and then say, these would not have worked if we would have done this. Like you, you have to actually give them 
something that that uh, you can't just go to them and say this is not secure. We're going to have to change that. They would say prove it. Yeah. I would say that the focus on raising the bar, even small amount, will have a huge impact. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, but um, I mean, one thing that you could do uh, is to actually look up the paper from Jarno okay. and actually just bring that and say, look, he's actually here's the numbers. So I mean, there's no reason to not roll out emails. It breaks very little things. Or, I mean, it breaks very little. <laughs> yep. I was simply going to say that it, Jana's paper, if people wanted um, to just email me, because we be published the paper, uh, but not public, but I can send it by email. But uh, what I wanted to say is. Oh, no, wait. You have actually. Uh, the video, yeah, then the, these are the slides, but there's the actual paper as well. And there's a video which. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Anyway. What I wanted to say, EMAT does great things. That was a point I made, and so it, it's, it's a choice you have to um, that you have to make. Yeah, but and this this wasn't about protecting against APTs. This was about making an example based on a data set. But still. Yeah, I'm just went on Twitter and asked for the paper. Is that correct, Martin? Don't, <laughs> Don't forget the underscore. Don't forget the underscore. It's a common mistake. I yes. Klaus. Okay, if, if, <laughs> yeah, if you hadn't given the common anyway. Provide an extra slot for a comment from, from your side uh, uh, so, uh, to get you into an argument. I'm, I'm still looking for. <laughs> okay, just kidding. Um, don't want to interrupt the question. Just just some numbers on email. I'm just four different employee profiles in a small bank. I have uh, to summarize in total half of the different email mitigations disabled if you summarize across the different profiles. Okay. Because it breaks things that don't work. Um, also, one of the recent Windows updates. But can't off. you just not? Uh, you can yeah, disable that profile, for for, for that specific profile. or I mean, for certain processes. Yeah. Yes, but some of the uh, mitigations. Yeah. Don't but that was not the point, anyway. I I would love to talk about this too, but let's do that over beers. In, instead. Yeah. No, I'm not from, no, no, I'm not from uh, Microsoft. <laughs> I can comment on this, Kai. Um, uh, we have a customer which is like in a six-figure uh, user number space. And they have started doing a, like pilot for 1,500 users in a, in a certain department, and they are very happy with it. Yeah. So I expect that... Uh, uh, to be deployed, maybe. I mean, it will take another three years, but uh, uh, at least I can uh, safely say very large organizations uh, start thinking about it. Uh, as, um, uh, there is a saying um, that we use internally if one had to choose uh, either yeah. go with an AV uh, solution on a Windows system or AMAT, just use one of both, go with it. That will, that will provide better protection uh, than going with compliance revenue. I've actually helped several companies with like more than 20,000 em em employees roll out them. There's been very little problems. And yeah. that's, you know, the typical companies. They've got the typical stuff. So. Yeah. One, one tool that I find works great and it's cost effective like the malware bytes anti malware is one of the few tools that after you mean the anti exploit no 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 oh, okay. anti malware is one of the few tools that even after <laughs> your stupid user actually clicks execute in the UAC prompt if, if he's allowed to uh, 
or, or if the malware bypasses UAC and it starts executing, malware bytes can still kill it, like the Internet uh, Explorer smart screen filter. That's it good. will kill it after execution, yeah, that's which good. is worthwhile. We're still really, you know, not on the topic of my talk at all. <laughs> but that's cool. Yeah, well, it is the topic you talk. These are all small things that you can Raise do to make it. Yeah, yeah, cotton. yeah. And that's Cost it. more money to attack you. Yeah, and that's, and that's it. it. Because some attackers will be able to keep up somewhat. But even the big people, the people that are targeting companies, they're not targeting company A. They're targeting company A, B, C, or D. Yeah, because... A is more expensive, they can get more money out of yeah. B, they'll go to B. There is actually, and that's where the Dino the, 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 you know, Dysovic quote doesn't really hold up, because if you're in, if you're in an outrun the bear s s scenario, then it doesn't really matter. Then you just have to you know, outrun some of, some, of, some of your pals. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, they've been using the same tactics, so actually we should be knowing how they're behaving. Yeah. So engage them. I mean, this is yeah. a fight, not just sit there and then keep whining yeah. and be complaining about this and defense for the past few years, but mm. engage them, as you said, and, and drive up the cost, and that's right. It'll turn out better. I think one of the main problems is that a lot of defense is done based on gut feeling. I'm going to do this, and then, you know, no one is attacking that. And that's just stupid. That's I mean, you, you actually need to look at where am I getting attacked and then do some, something there. And you also need to actually understand how does the attack works. So you can't really imp implement Emmet and go, oh, everything is good. And then someone comes along and find like a logical bug in IE because that won't help at all. So you need to realize that too. Really? <laughs> we fail to learn lessons of, of actual real-world security. That's how, what, what goes on when you engage with an opponent. Yeah, but they're really good at opening the calculator, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and it's not. Okay. okay, so... Thanks again, Andreas. You, you had a question, too. Okay. Ah. Thank you very much.